welcome. Um, on behalf of the um, AIA Potomac Valley CRAN Committee, which is a produces program for everybody. Um, and we are doing that on behalf of the tri-chapter capital area CRAN, uh, which is uh, something started in 2013 to uh, serve architects, uh, residential architects, uh, specifically custom residential in the DC area. Um, and is comprised of uh, AIA Potomac Valley together with AIA DC and AIA Northern Virginia. So um, we are very glad to be bringing this program to everybody because this is a subject I dare say most of us have not re-examined um, too often in our uh, careers. And, and it's about a very important part of the project obviously is which is um, as built drawings, getting them right and um, so we'll be talking about the whole uh, range of, or our presenters will be about the whole range of ways to do that, uh, including some new technology uh, that they're gonna educate us about. And I'm very excited to be part of this program because um, I'm very eager to know what's out there uh, and better ways to do what we're doing. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to say thank you to our chapter sponsors uh, who've made it possible for, to do us, for us to do great CRAN programs for um, residential architects, um, including of course the presenters, uh, Precision Property oh, Measurement uh, and Barron's and uh, TW Perry, which are uh, area uh, suppliers that we all know. And um, moving along, I will introduce you now to our speakers who are Justin Yotter, who's the regional director of PPM and Colin Maloney, who's uh, gotten up early to present to us. He's way out in California and he's the regional director for the Bay Area. Thank you both for presenting and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much for uh for introducing us. And I, as Helen said, I'm Justin Yotter. I'm the regional director for the Mid-Atlantic region here in out of DC. And I'm joined by my colleague, Colin, from uh, the Bay Area of California. Hello, everyone. And this slide, uh, I know Sue already mentioned it a little bit, but I'm going to uh, require reading here is uh, credits earned on completion of this course will be reported to the AIA CES for AIA members. Certificates of completion for both AIA members and non-AIA members are available upon request. Uh, please go ahead and email or chat to pam at aiapv.org to get that. This course is registered with AIA CES for continuing professional education. As such, it does not include content that may be deemed or construed to be an approval or endorsement by the AIA of any material of construction or any method or manner of handling using, distributing, or dealing in any material or product. Questions related to specific materials, methods, and services will be addressed at the conclusion of this presentation. Justin, if I may, uh, I just want to remind everybody to mute if you're um, not speaking during this presentation so that everybody will uh, be able to hear well. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. So the next two slides are going to be covered for the most part in the actual presentation, but as part of the AIA CES, here's a little bit of information about the course. And here is a slide about the learning objectives, which we'll actually get into in the next slide as we start the presentation. So what are we going to talk about today here? There's gonna be four objectives. The first is what are as-built plans? We'll cover some common definitions, when as-built are needed, gathering various degrees of information for producing as built and when projects require a detailed scope. Then we'll cover some traditional surveying methods such as sketching, the plan view measurements, and the Z-axis. Then we'll get into the new era of as-built laser scanning. We'll talk a little bit about terrestrial scanners and mobile scanners, as well as what the data output is of those, the point cloud, and how to use that point cloud. Then we'll talk a little bit about creating an as-built set, 
drafting from the traditional method and drafting from a point cloud. Throughout the presentation, we are going to have a series of polls or questions in which I'll ask you either a multiple choice question or an open-ended question. And at the end, with what time we have, we can open it up for questions if there are any time. So let's get started. What are as-built plans? Some common definitions that we'll cover are when looking into the actual definition of an as-built plan, one will mostly find is a definition that concerns as-built plans being created after or during new construction or after or during a renovation. The definition here is as-built drawings are prepared by the contractor. They show in red ink on-site changes to the original construction documents. They are more like interpolations done for construction purposes. Therefore, the changes that a contractor makes onto the original design are called as-built drawings. Contractor developed as-builts should not be construed with record drawings created, of course, by the architect or engineer. Record or archive drawings often include the information gathered on as-builts and are the final set of formally developed prints fully signed and stamped by the project engineer or architect. This definition reads, record drawings are prepared by the architect and reflect on-site changes the contractor noted in the as-built drawings. They are often compiled as a set of on-site changes made for the owner per the owner-architect contract. This is not always mandatory and created, but in general, some formal architectural services create these as one of the late tasks of a building project. And of course, Everyone here takes the time to do this on every project, right? So the first audience question we have for you, and please share this in the chat, is what terms do you and your team use to describe as-built plans? I'll give a minute or so here for people to type in what they use for terminology. Existings, that is one I've heard a lot out here on the East Coast. As built, as built existing condition drawings. Yep, all of those are ones that uh, I typically hear out here, existing conditions. Thank you, thank you. Are there any others? Plans drawing of the existing house. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Provided by contractor, CEC. All right, cool, cool. Some good answers. Measure drawings. All good answers. All right. So we're going to start moving on here. You can continue to keep putting answers in the chat if you'd like. We can look at them later if we have time. So again, what is an as-built plan? So let's just keep this simple. In the architecture and construction industry, as-built refers to a drawing that shows the existing dimensions and conditions of a building space or area. So what is then an as-built survey? It's simply the entire process of measuring and drafting or modeling the as-built plans. Before we get any further, though, I want to say that throughout the presentation, we'll be discussing producing as-built plans in their final format as either 2D CAD files or a 3D Revit model. Both are softwares created by Autodesk. As you likely all know, there are many, many other drafting and modeling softwares out there. So even though we're mentioning Autodesk software, it's likely that you can apply any points that I make about 2D drafting software to all others on the market, as well as 3D modeling software, such as Chief Architect, Archicad, Vectorworks, et cetera. So what are some contributing factors to when as-builts are needed? Pretty much whenever we're working with an existing building, we need as-builts before starting design. If the owner or client happens to already have as-built drawings, then we may just need to enter them into CAD or reformat them if they are already in CAD and confirm that the drawings are up to date. If errors or inconsistencies are found, then at some point you may decide that a fresh set is needed. So what are some contributing factors to when as-built aren't needed? 
It is rare that clients already have current as built of their existing buildings that are accurate, but it does happen. So in that case, of course, you would not need more before starting your project. There are also simple cosmetic projects that do not require having as built And of course, if a building is being built from scratch, then all you'll likely need are the construction documents. So when is the best time to obtain as-built plans? In most cases, obtaining as-built files is one of the very first steps in the renovation process, if not the first step. Getting ahead of this step allows an architect to focus on their design, plan creation, and submittal to the building department, all of which are considerably more time consuming than that first step. There are also cases where you'll be working with a historic review and then and they will require as built to be created. And if you are working on a teardown project, some building departments require you submit as built of the structures being demolished. As mentioned on the previous slide, different municipalities work differently and have different requirements. If they require as built for any reason, the type or the scope needed may vary from city to city. If you plan to preserve or improve upon detailed architectural elements, such as ornamentation, you'll need to consider that documentation and where it fits into your timing. Overall, the size and scope of your project will determine when as built are needed. And as we'll discuss in the next section, to what degree the detail and scope of as built are required. So you've discovered you'll need as built. How far and in how much detail do you need your information to go? What types of plans are needed based on the project? Above are a few examples of plan types and when they're needed in your as-built plan set. For example, most of the time, you will likely need floor plans. However, if your work impacts the exterior, such as a facade renovation, a historic facade or window replacement, et cetera, you might need exterior elevations. However, if you're working with an existing structure where you might be into some height constraints, such as attics or basements or crawl spaces, uh, or in the district, you're dealing with uh, District of Columbia re height requirements for the building itself, you might need sections. Or if you're modifying existing lighting, or there are unique ceiling conditions, such as coffers or trays, or perhaps exposed structural elements, you might need reflected ceiling plans. It's ultimately, ultimately up to you as the architect to decide what the scope should be for your as-built plan set or consulting with your engineer as Why well on what might be needed. Because I'm doing a seminar. Why are you showering? Can we please um, mute? It's a continuing education credit. Before we get into specifics regarding plan types, <laughs> let's go over some of the ways to gather on-site information starting with a very simple, quick method, and then ending with full-blown as-built plans. Okay, so now we know what we need and why we need it. Now, how do we get it? One way to obtain the answers you need on site before renovation is by simply taking photos. This can assist in the design process and answer questions you might have before proceeding. However, sometimes a quick single line or even a bubble diagram is all you might need to achieve your goals. This can be achieved quite quickly on site and does not need to be to scale. Sketching can be very helpful in supporting your design in the case of interior elevations or perspectives. This can also be done roughly and may not require a measurement. If drawings need to be to scale, such as when they'll be used to create new construction documents, then you might need to go to a higher level of accuracy and measure the existing conditions. Most remodel projects require a more detailed scope for as built This will give you a head start in the creation of your design, submittal, and construction documents. In summary of the first section, we learned that as-built plans simply defined as a set of plans of any structure as it exists at that moment. They're most often used for a renovation of some type. We've also discussed getting as-built drawings in the format in which you work is important, such as a particular software. And the scope of the as-built plans and the detail of each scope 
item will vary with the needs of your project. Now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Colin. He's going to talk a little bit about traditional surveying methods. Yes, thanks, Justin. And apologies ahead of time. My office is next to the Oakland Airport. I'm out in the San Francisco Bay Area and a plane might fly over. So um, I'll try to talk louder when that happens. Um, so now we'll talk about an as-built production method that's near and dear to my heart, sketching, which I've done for probably the majority of my as-built creation career, uh, as opposed to the other methods we'll talk about later. So sketching, here's how you might sketch. First of all, remember that sketching does not need to be to scale. All you need to do is make sure that there's room to write in the measurements that you need and that it's visually easy enough to follow when you're back in the office. You can use different colors on your sketch to mark different measurements um, so that your eye catches each segment accordi accordingly while you're drafting and you don't spend all that time hunting for little things on your sheet. Uh, get as much sketching done as you can before you measure uh, so that you can just focus on measurement when the, when the time comes and execute those measurements. The better your sketch is, the easier your measurement will be. Uh, if it's sketched correctly, any stru structure can be measured quickly than if not. Leave room to write in your measurements and uh, plan ahead to get your heights or measurement on the Z axis. Most of the time, this information can still be displayed in plan view, but occasionally you'll want to sketch in section or elevation view. And we'll talk about this again in the next few slides. Sketch out any details or ornamentation to the degree of precision you desire to be able to add those measurements later. All right, now it's time to add those measurements to your sketch. So an important step that many people skip when measuring a structure is going around those exterior faces. Often a wall thickness is taken at an exterior wall and then the interior measurements only from there on out. But I consider this step to be crucial. Uh, start by measuring all the lengths 360 degrees around. And to check your work, you'll want to add up all the X and Y values. See that lower right corner on this sketch? You'll see that you did the math to add up the values on each side. And this, of course, can get complicated if your structure has curved or wall angled walls that aren't 90 degrees. But adding up all the X values and all the Y values and having them come very close will mean that you're on the right track. In this sketch, you'll notice that there's some overall measurements as well as small incremental measurements. The overalls are in red and the, the small incremental ones are in pencil. It's a good system of checks and balances that will not only improve your overall accuracy, it may save you in the event that you have an incorrect measurement or notation. Don't forget to good, get good photo coverage as well. That will help you verify that what you're drafting is indeed correct. Occasionally I've seen errors that don't appear as errors on paper, but they're very obvious when you're looking at an image as well. On this sheet, you can see uh, that we have the previous sketch below, and then there's a sheet of vellum on top of it. This allows you to use that information from the first sketch, such as the wall layout, doors and windows, and then add even more symbols to that uh, in you know, different colors that you've designated for your plans and showing symbols that, you're, that you'll be able to recognize when you're in the office drafting. So now let's talk about collecting the z-axis measurements or height information using these traditional methods. You can use a tape measure to measure all the risers in the stairs or drop it down a balcony, run it up a wall, etc. A laser disto uh, can perform trigonomic functions instantly and get you heights in all sorts of ways. So the first of these two tools you might already be using to measure the other aspects of your plan, plan and plan view on the X and Y axis, but this third one is used exclusively to get height information. It's called a zip level. This is an excellent tool invented. No, I haven't talked to him yet. Uh, excuse me, don't forget to mute, please. Um, I know we're all excited about the zip level. Uh, this is an excellent tool invented, distributed and repaired if needed by a company out of San Diego. 
I'm not aware of any other version of this tool. Okay, you want to? Yeah. Okay, so I'll just leave that with you. Yeah. Okay. It uses displacement to read heights anywhere. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Range. Can we hunt that? I think it's JP Ward, maybe that was taught. I'm not sure, but please make sure you're muted. Okay. So moving right along. However, you've collected your height measurements, you got to make sure that you have them in the places that you'll need them. Most of the areas will be obvious, like the tops and bottoms of the staircases. You want to get those floor to floor heights and any change in finished floor height. And you can see in this, in this quick sketch, it's just a plan view drawing, but it's showing those height differences with some notation. So plan on what you'll need to see in those exterior elevations ahead of time and sketch sections. Make sure you either have some height and pitch information for your roof or every height that you can get on the roof if it's safe to climb around up there. Make sure not to forget the heights of openings such as windows and doors and headers um, and the heights of things like a sconce on the wall if you plan to produce those detailed interior elevations. Here we see a quick sketch of a roof and it's got some height readings that were taken with using that zip level we talked about earlier. So to sum up the section, the second portion of this presentation, having the perfect sketch isn't important. What you need is a sketch that displays and contains all the measurements you'll need in drafting. It doesn't need to look pretty either. You need to encapsulate the structure by measuring all the way around it. This will give you the correct scale when you begin drafting and ensure your interior measurements are correct as well. After taking the measurements of more major items like walls, doors, and windows, then you can move on to the next level of detail as needed. This can be for cabinetry, plumbing fixtures, or even electrical and ceiling components. And now I'm going to hand it back over to my colleague, Justin, and we're gonna talk about some of the new era stuff to uh, obtain this as-built information. Take it away, Justin. Thanks, Colin. The uh, change to completely new technology and ditching some, if not all, of the traditional methods isn't easy in any industry. But using LiDAR allows for fast data acquisition performed by a skilled surveyor using 3D laser scanners. It's also more accurate than any measurement that can be taken by hand. This technology can be purchased, rented, or contracted. It's a thorough solution. It allows surveyors to gather more data than needed to complete most projects. And it provides a digital twin to pull additional data down the line if the project ever needs to be revisited or if additions need to be made to the scope of work. Here are some examples of each type. The terrestrial or scan standing scanner on the left, the Leica BLK360, or the mobile walking scanner, the GeoSlam Zeb Revo on the right. Either way you choose to go, you'll be using LiDAR to create a point cloud. LiDAR is a method for measuring distances by illuminating the target with a laser light and measuring the reflection with a sensor. Each one of those illuminations then can be considered a measurement. Each single measurement is then logged and throughout the course of the scan, millions of measurements are taken in every direction. So let's talk for just a minute about a terrestrial scanner I'm familiar with, the Leica BLK360. Overall, you'll find that the terrestrial scanners like this one will give you a much more rich, dense point cloud than a mobile scanner would. Some terrestrial scanners offer extremely high levels of precision to their clouds. In the next slide, we'll see a short video of a scan of a single family residence done with this scanner. As you can see, it collects a lot of data all around as you scan. This scanner picks up color as well and has thermal detection capabilities if you're interested in measuring for that kind of thing. You can see that it has the photorealism with the material color so that you can actually see almost in photoreal quality. And this reprocesses as it's moving. So you see that it gets crisper as it stops moving. 
Now we can talk and touch on a scanner that I'm most familiar with, which is a mobile scanner, the GeoSlam Zabrivo. The trade-off for a less dense point cloud or a hyper level of precision is that with the mobile scanner, you greatly reduce your time on site scanning and increase your mobility greatly since you're moving and the scanner does not need to be mounted to anything. In fact, you can either you can even mount other equipment on them, such as a GoPro camera, or mount the excuse me, or mount the camera itself to a drone. Next, we'll watch a short video displaying the output from a scanner like the one you see here. You may notice that the coloration of materials is not included like the Leica, but it does have a height ramp visibility where different heights are shown as different colors on the spectrum. You can see here the green to the blue. The cloud is a little bit more fuzzy, but it still has millions of points and it still collects a lot of data. This is a single family residence, even though it is very large and one family, believe it or not, lives in that large property. Scanning with a mobile scanner is preferable if your time on site is limited in any way. Mobile scanning can give you the ability to not only scan the project quickly, but also have time to process the scan on site. Once the scan is then complete, you need to process it using the software that is essentially an algorithm that interprets all the measurements and arranges them into a point cloud. So now let's talk about this infamous point cloud for a minute. Reviewing your data well before attempting to create a set of as built from a point cloud is a must. If there are any kinds of errors with your cloud, which do happen, then using that bad data can either stop you in your tracks later when you're drafting or modeling, or even worse, result in an incorrect set of as built once your scan has processed, you'll need to review the output. Did you cover all the areas? Did all the rooms get covered? Are there any gaps in the data? Are there any flaws or errors such as drifting? Make sure to look for any of this drifting, which can occur when the software has trouble putting all the points together. If it occurs, then you can try some reprocessing options or simply scan the structure again. Drifting is common with mobile scanners and it occurs for several different reasons. Determining which reason is helpful before attempting to reprocess or rescan your project. This picture here is a ex great example of what drifting looks like in the point cloud. When scanning attics, foundations, large sites or multi-level structures, et cetera, that's when you may run into issues with the cloud and the scanner. Areas that are harder to access or have less unique features, such as repetitive hallways, or if a space has lots of reflected surfaces, those can cause issues. Processing requires all the areas have data connecting one area to the other so that they can be properly glued or stitched together. Mirrors and moving objects, et cetera, can also trick the process and therefore give you a bad output. Most scanners have a pretty far range and will shoot out the windows and when they're outside, pretty much all over the place. You may need to clip or crop the cloud to reduce the size and then delete the unneeded data. If you have to take multiple separate scans for whatever reason, then knowing how to merge those separate clouds together is useful. Much like traditional methods of sketching and measuring, properly scanning a structure takes lots of practice to do it correctly and efficiently. So how do we use that point cloud now? Now that you've processed and reviewed the outcome of your point cloud data, you'll need to do one of the following things. Do it all again if it came out poorly and can't be reprocessed. Or if it turned out well, go back to your drafting and modeling station to get started with the next phase. 
which is in order to produce items such as a floor plan, you need to be able to slice the point cloud into a desired section and work from that. Most of the software allows you to do that pretty easily. In addition to cutting sections, you'll need to be able to move or rotate the cloud around to give you the working angle that you desire. So in summary of the third section about the new era of data collection for as built what did we learn? We learned scanning your project can reduce errors and time spent on site. The type of scanner you use will be dictated by your needs and level of detail required. And your scanner will create a cloud made up of millions of points. Knowing how to manipulate it is crucial. That way it will have utility once brought into your preferred software. And as an added note, my perspective has been that almost overnight, as built production methods have shifted from traditional, done that way for decades, to utilizing the latest in laser technology. As with every new introduction of production methods, there's a learning curve, but once mastered, the entire process gets much smoother. When incorporated with BIM technologies, the entire construction process can get a boost in speed, efficiency, and a lesser environmental impact. All right, now I'm gonna turn it back over to my colleague Colin again for talking about how to create an as-built plan set. Thanks, Justin. So now that you've collected the measurements in the field, it's time to create the actual plan sets. So it's important to keep these organized and concise, but at the same time, leave all the room for your notes and your building codes, et cetera, so you can be used for your design layouts, your demo plans, your construction documents, et cetera, as discussed earlier. I know we've been recently talking about scanning, so I'm gonna ask that you shift gears back to that traditional method for a minute. Um, and we'll talk about how to translate those sketches that we made into great as-built plants. So prop your sketch next to your computer. It's a pretty straightforward process. You're gonna use vector-based drafting software to draft at full scale, uh, entering the actual measurements from your on-site sketch. If you're modeling in Revit from a sketch, it's more difficult, but it's not impossible. Uh, you're building rather than you're drawing. So you'll often find that you need to let the model dictate certain measurements rather than using your own, just bend them a little bit. For a floor plan, you'll primarily be using the line tool in combination with uh, whatever blocks you've created. And again, we're talking about 2D drafting now. Uh, the perimeter line usually comes first, the first thing that you measured in the field as well. Uh, next, next slide, you're going to want to go ahead and draft all of your walls first and then put in all the windows and doors. We call that stuff kind of control. If there's multiple levels, you'll need to draft when using your measurement. You'll only need to draft using your measurements, but then you'll also want to be cognizant of those stairwell walls and the exterior faces of the structure to make sure that they line up exactly as they do in real life. So once those controlling items are done, you can draft in with perhaps a lesser degree of precision, the cabinetry, the plumbing fixtures, appliances, et cetera, into your drawing. For an electrical and reflected ceiling plan, it's much the same. Just follow what you've sketched and measured and add the items in one by one. So now we're looking at a roof plan. Uh, you'll need to at least have sketched the behavior of the roof correctly in the field or by using a nice clear satellite photo. This means all of those hips and valleys and ridges, the directions of the slopes. This and the measured length of that overhang should get you to a place where you can draft the roof in plan view. On the same sketch, you'll also need to have collected all the height information. Uh, this is often achieved by using the zip level, which we mentioned and showed you earlier, and actually getting on the roof to take all those needed heights. There are other mes methods, though, such as using an angle finder or a level, torpedo level, digital level, um, and using those various functions of your distal laser as well. 
Drafting and elevations will come entirely from your floor plan and your roof plan sketches. The only exception is those special sketches which show certain aspects of ornamentation on the exterior. You may have gone into detail there. Drafting elevations will entail just placing all the windows and doors correctly with the correct heights. And of course, it's important to ensure that they correspond directly with the floor plans in all those cases. Any decorative items you sketched and measured can be drafted as well. Drafting a roof in an elevation view is one of the most difficult challenges, and it needs to correspond perfectly from left to right to all the other elevation views. Once the cut location and direction are determined, uh, you can use the floor and ceiling information you've sketched and measured on site to complete the section view. Uh, to draft the roof properly in section view, it's highly advised that you have your elevation drawings finished first, and then you can use them, you can drag lines from them to finish off your section. So now we can shift our thinking back to the scanner method and doing this work using the point cloud we've created. And we'll talk about creating a plan, plan set from that. If you've used laser technology to measure, you'll be drafting from a point cloud. This can be imported directly into your CAD or Revit software. Autodesk requires that you use another software called Recap to prepare the point cloud for the import and ensure it works with their software. Drafting from a point cloud in CAD is pretty straightforward, but it takes getting used to. Modeling from a point cloud in Revit has a few less options. There are lots of options in CAD to adjust the cloud in several ways, and you'll need to use the view cube to rotate your UCS orientation properly to work with the cloud in different positions. Uh, since the entire program is focused on modeling for the, now when we're talking about Revit, that, that program is entirely focused on modeling from a particular view range. It allows you to manipulate your model and the cloud simultaneously. Thanks, Justin. First, we can talk about drafting the plan view items from a cloud. When drafting in CAD from a point cloud, you want to ensure that your cloud is positioned orthogonally so that you can use the ortho function in CAD to draw your lines. Positioning the cloud on the Z axis in CAD is also desirable for several reasons. You should be able to derive all the walls, doors, and door swings right from the point cloud. Window information can be found as well when you're skilled at reviewing your clouds. Many scanners will not pick up smaller items, especially if they're flush with the walls or the ceilings. Trying to locate them in the cloud can be very time consuming. It's possible, uh, but it's oftentimes better to revert, revert to the traditional method while you're in the, in the field and just sketch and measure all those things, and draft them in that way. Now let's get into drafting other views such as elevations from the cloud. This is where there's a huge advantage in having a complete point cloud for drafting. Provided that you were able to access the roof and scanning, you'll have a complete picture of not only the roof behavior, but also every height you'll need to properly draft your roof. Exterior elevations and sections as well. As with the electrical and RCP components, sometimes it's beneficial to sketch and measure those ornamental things that might not show up so easily in the point cloud and then add them in your drafting. So now let's talk about the Revit as-built model. Uh, so first, we need to touch on the level of development system. It was created for the AEC community to put standards on BIM drawings. It rates the precision, detail, and overall refinement you can take your model to. With level 100 being the lowest, meaning you just mass your objects roughly, and level 500 being the highest, where it's so detailed and exact, you're essentially building a virtual version of your structure. When modeling as built, LOD 2 to 300 seems to be the applicable range since you're assessing a structure that has been built from the outside. All those interstitial spaces are inaccessible and their construction cannot and should not be assumed. When electrical and RCP elements are needed in your as built model, 
they will likely be drafted in the plan set in a sim similar way to CAD rather than in 3D Revit. The items are placed correctly in their 3D locations, but they may not have 3D functionality themselves. Revit has many tools to build site plans and add topography if needed. If you only plan to model as built of a structure, you may want to limit your site work to the areas that surround or touch the structure only, if at all. In the case of exterior elevations like this one, you want to make sure that the finished grade is accurate along the face of the house. This can be achieved without going into all of Revit's topography tools and instead just using some drawing tools. There are some advantages to having a BIM as built, which some may, may not know. Sometimes a three-dimensional model is only considered for presentation or design purposes, but it also can be useful as an as built as well. The as built BIM model has already the existing phasing, so you can dig right in and start a project to use the powerful phasing tools to show demo and proposed. There's no time wasted moving from the design phase to the construction documents phase of a project using this 3D software. Having an as-built BIM model can make it easier to understand a project that you haven't visited yourself since you can cut those sections and view the existing spaces and roof massing in 3D. Some say Revit offers a more intuitive design experience and allows users to present 3D images at the planning stages to the owner or planning departments. So to sum up the fourth portion of this presentation, drafting from sketches into CAD is a pretty straightforward process. It takes time to become efficient, but you'll just be entering measurements into CAD straight from your sketch sheets. Modeling into Revit from sketches can be done, of course, but you may find that during the modeling, you'll need to ignore certain measurements in lieu of letting the powerful software just build the model properly. Drafting from a point cloud in both CAD and Revit means that you'll be importing the cloud itself directly into the software and essentially tracing or placing components right on top of the cloud to create your set of plans. All right, this concludes the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education System course. Thank you, I wanna thank you so much for coming and I hope you were able to gain some insight into the subject I'm so passionate about. We do have an audience question I'd like to ask quick and then we'll jump right into the Q&A since we don't have a ton of time here and we're almost up to our hour. Um, but audience question, just type your answer in the chat. Uh, approximately how long would it take your team to measure and draft a 1,500 square foot single family residence? Everybody's so quick, it's zero time. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Six to eight hours, hours, 32 to 40 hours, four hours, wow, four to five hours. One hour, eight to 10, 12. We've got quite a range here. That's that's <laughs> quite a range. It's good we need to, to see hire, you. hire so, that person that can do it in an hour and make sure we get their info. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you, everybody, um, for the for the input on the QA. Repeat how to use a zip level. Why don't we go right into the two questions? I know we had a question from James. Um, Abby, can you reread for me what the question was from James? I think it had to do with the 360 camera, and then we'll get to the other question about the zip level. Um, sure. sure, Justin. His question is, what is a 3D camera? Um, he said he believes Leica makes one. How can it be used, and what is the cost? Sure. Uh, if you're if you're referring to just a I don't want to call it just a simple 360 camera, but if you're referring to just a simple 360 camera, um, there's a bunch of them out there. We happen to use the Ricoh Theta um, for taking measurements or taking photos, 360 photos on site. If you're referring to a scanner that does 360 photos, like the photogrammetry, um, the Leica has a number of different project products out there. 
Um, I actually will kind of defer to Colin a little bit because he's been around it a little longer. Me, he may have additional uh, input. Yeah, no, three, you know, you, you got to discern between photogrammetry and actual points and point clouds. So I think the question is about 3D photos. So you can either get the handheld theta, which is a really inexpensive option. Um, Matterport scanners are another option that I'm sure you're all familiar with. You've seen them on all the real estate uh, websites. And yeah, if you're if you want to collect point clouds and photogrammetry, like Justin mentioned, the, the BLK uh, that we talked about in the presentation is excellent. And that's that's going to cost you up into the tens of thousands of dollars. Thank you. I want to answer these in order that they came in. Hopefully that answered your question about the 360 camera. Um, repeat how to use a zip level. The audience distracted from the presentation. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll take that one, too. that one. Zip level. Uh, I've got another person on here that says they love their zip level. I love my zip level. Um, it's really simple. It uses uh, displacement uh, to give you height readings digitally. Uh, there's there's liquid and gas inside of it, and it's connected to a 50 foot cable. You connect the the readout to a unipod, a one legged tripod, and you just walk around and it gives you a reading. And what you do is you zero it somewhere like the front door entry finished floor. And then you can go anywhere you want within 50 feet and just get the difference in height in whatever units you choose um, to take spot elevations essentially. So it's a great tool. You wanna get it calibrated once a year, send it back in to uh, get it calibrated, make sure it's working right. Thank you, Colin. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, and if you have more questions, we can we can certainly answer them uh, outside of this presentation if we run out of time. Scanning options, the newer iPhone and iPads. Um, so what my experiences have been, and I know Colin has looked into this a little bit uh, in the past, uh, very little bit after a question was raised to him about that. But I'll say what I know about it, which is the LiDAR on the new iPhones is directional based. So basically you have to point it at an object and go around that object to get the object scanned. Um, the mobile and terrestrial scanners scan in 360 degrees as you're in a space. And so um, I would, without knowing more about it specifically, I would say that um, you're for building purposes and accuracy purposes, uh, iPhone has a little ways to go to get to where the uh, technology is that we use to measure buildings. Um, that'd be my, my two cents um, on that. Uh, how do you manipulate the photos from the 360 degree camera? Well, I guess um, I'm not sure exactly what you're hoping to manipulate them by, but the, the software that comes with like the Ricoh Theta, for example, for just a flat 360, and not a flat, but a a 360 image, the, the software that comes with it, you just pan around and and you can go in all 360 degrees then to see what's around you wherever you placed it. We usually go around the building and take a bunch of uh, photos, 360 photos. Um, as far as the, like the Leica and the Matterport and things like that, uh, the only real manipulation you do is that each one, the the imagery basically has the laser points with it so you can measure to those points as part of the cloud um at least that's the nuance uh that i know so i don't know um yeah i'll just know. add to what i'll just add to what you're saying justin it's 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 important to remember the difference between photogrammetry and actual measured points because photogrammetry you're uh you know i've i've heard of people trying to hack into uh, programs with just 360 photos and actually take that into CAD or Revit to draft from with pretty bad results um, because you're not using actual measurements, you're just using photographs. So you'll want to be careful with any sort of manipulation in, in that realm to, to get your plan set out of it. Okay, thank you, Colin, for that additional. Um, we have some time for some more questions. Um, it is an hour and a half credit course is what I'm being reminded. So um, we do have some more time. Are there other questions on the on traditional surveying methods or the laser scanning 
um, technology. Um, so in the time on site or time measuring and uh, drafting, I just wanted to kind of go back to the range that that we had uh, for the audience uh, participation. And that's that typically for like a 1500 square foot house, um, you know, we're gonna be probably maybe three hours on site to laser scan it. And then, you know, a few hours uh, in CAD once we're back in the office to, to model it uh, or draft it rather, I should say. Um, so the people that are doing it in an hour, like Colin said, I, I would love to, to hire some of those folks um especially for some of my larger uh homes that i scan out here on the east coast um are there other questions how do you deal with the mirrors and pendant lights um so uh jp how do we deal with the mirrors is basically uh, either try to hide them, for example, if they're on the back side of a door or something like that, we just keep prop the doors open, et cetera. Um, if they're in any other place, we actually take uh, butcher paper with us and we'll just cover the mirrors or a portion of the mirror. Um, depending on the scanner, they get more or less confused. And so um, we just cover them with paper and that usually is enough to distract them and, and get them to stay where they're at. Um, and pendant lights, I'll just, uh, sorry, I almost forgot about that part of it. Pendant lights are really not an issue. Uh, basically, anything uh, that is in the space, as Colin mentioned in the, um, the smaller items, if it's less than an inch, basically, it's going to have a hard time grabbing uh, the point data. But anything that's in the space, it's going to grab it. So actually, hanging light fixtures are great for reflected ceiling plans because it'll capture all of that. Uh, and make it a lot easier to get the RCP. Um, tolerances, uh, talk more about tolerances. I, what would you like to know? The, the mobile scanner that we use for most projects that uh, Zeb Revo is a half inch tolerance. It's accurate to within a half inch up to about 90 feet, 30 meters. Um, the more open or repetitive of the space, the, the more tricky it can be with, with keeping with that tolerance. But uh, that's why we take the perimeter measurements to lock in scaling and things. The uh, the horizons that we have is actually very similar. It's another mobile scanner. Um, that is accurate up to 90 meters uh, in the same fashion, the half inch tolerance. Um, the Leica, the big difference in that in the tolerances with the Leica or the terrestrial scanners and the mobile scanners is that it actually it'll take longer it collects more data and therefore it can be more accurate but it does take more time on site um this, there's more setups and the time per scan in each location takes a little bit a uh, little bit longer um hopefully that answered your question james if you want a follow-up question please by all means ask it uh tom wants to know once you have a point cloud you're essentially tracing over it to create drawings in cad uh, more or less, um, like I said, we take some hand measurements to kind of make sure that the scaling is correct, but um, each side of the wall will will have, you know, um, a little bit of cloud data. And so, you know, we have our own standards for how we adjust for that and draw over top of it uh, and use a little bit of common sense for when things, you know, um, come up at a dimension that, that don't make sense. But uh, but yeah, essentially we're modeling with objects or drafting over over the point cloud lines. Did I miss the pricing? Uh, we haven't gone into specific pricing. Uh, you, you please feel free to contact us outside of the program and we can talk pricing. But um, for 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 contract services, we're pretty competitive. Um, the prices for all contractors that do this kind of thing are. Uh, varied as varied as the companies are that do it uh, and the type of equipment that they use um, to purchase them i can tell you that uh i think colin maybe you know better than i do but i think like the zeb revo is like 50 yeah, the, the, the scanner itself is expensive and the software that you use to process your point clouds is very expensive so 
we're talking high tens of thousands of dollars for, for the mobile scanners and the Zeb repo stuff. And then um, to touch on tolerances again, I think Faro, which is a company we didn't talk about that makes a scanner, they're, they're, now you're approaching $100,000 and they boast a 16th inch accuracy. But the problem with it is when you're looking at a point cloud, especially in plan view, even a wall, may not be completely plumb and you'll have a little bit of variation there. So it really depends on where you're cutting it and looking at it uh, to be able to get that hyper level of precision if, that, if that's what you're trying to get. Thank you, Colin. Mm -hmm. uh, and rental costs, I don't have a specific cost for that. There are some companies that do it, but then you still have to know how to use it, um, which it takes a little practice to, to get to know the quirks of each different kind of equipment. So um, we have some people that, in our um, within PPM that have uh, used a lot of different kinds of equipment and are really good at all of them. Uh, we have others that just use certain types of equipment and have gotten really good at it. Um, Luella, hopefully that answered your question. Uh, if you want to follow up, that that's great. I'll, as well. I'll Why take is the zip, zip level. level? Oh, what was that? I'll take the zip level question. <laughs> okay, you you got your eyes on it already. Anytime I get to talk about a zip level on the, yeah. It's uh, why is it better than using a Bosch laser me measuring tool? It's, it's not necessarily better, it's just different. You're getting a completely different type of measurement because you can walk around freely putting it anywhere you want within a 50 foot radius and it gives you a height difference. Uh, you can't do that with a, a handheld Bosch because you're just kind of shooting down. I'm not aware if Bosch makes anything similar to a zip level, maybe they do. Um, but if we are talking about laser measuring tools, a point and shoot distance measuring tool, you're gonna wanna go with the Leica Disto. It's it's uh, far superior to the Bosch. I would recommend doing that too. It's a little more money, but um, it's a more reliable tool for sure. Thank you, Colin. Mm -hmm. uh, ballpark fee to produce as-built drawings for a 3000 square foot house. Um, as I'm sure you can all appreciate, uh, complexity of the home and the scope of work can vary that greatly. Um, you know, we, we could talk ranges, but again, I, I think if, if you want to know prices, we do have a um, generic pricing on our uh, website, um, you know, for floor plans only for 1200 or 1000 to 1200 square feet start at about $750 for a minimum um, for, for floor plans only. Um, beyond that scope complexity all that comes into play for for up from there for scope and and size and whatnot uh jp does furniture need to be removed no um the key thing is we just need to be able to at least get the critical portions of the wall on all sides we open blinds and curtains and things like that so we can get the edges of windows um, but generally speaking uh furniture doesn't need to be uh moved Except for, I will say, if you're doing an electrical plan and we need to measure the locations of outlets and things like that, we might need to move a, a table or couch or something. Pick up, James, pick up your regular construction on true angles. Yes, in fact, uh, we have sort of our standards for over certain distances, how much something can be untrue before we uh, actually draw it that way or keep it non-orthogonal. Um, so yeah, it'll pick up, it'll pick up that a wall is angled and, and I've re-scanned projects thinking that it was supposed to be orthogonal and turns out to actually truly not be orthogonal. So um, it will pick that up. Um, some people want to have those modeled as irregular um, or drafted as non-irregular or as irregular. Um, some people want them to be made true as they, as they quote unquote should be. Um, but we work with all of our clients to, to figure out what, what you prefer. Yeah, exactly. You might, you might get a phone call. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, question from somebody named conference, uh, since the laser technology is line of sight, how do you work in a space space with many columns? Um, it really depends on the type of laser scanner that we need to use and the type of space. Uh, with the handhelds, um, we can do a number of things. Uh, we try to put things in the space. We might move a chair, we might 
um, you know, put something where it breaks up the monotony of the repetition of columns. Um, there's also these things that are QR codes, basically, that you can print out. I do that. I've done that with uh, the Matterport, actually, um, because that really gets confused with rep repetition. Um, but yeah, there's a number of different ways that you can handle handle that. Um, try to go around them as much as possible. I don't know, maybe Colin, you have some additional things you could add to that, but. Yeah, um, yeah, I think the question is more about how do you get the information behind those those columns blocking you and that that's simple. You just, you need to weave in and out uh, of the columns and scan eat all sides of them. And the same can be done with your terrestrial scanner. You just need to set it up in a lot more positions um, so that you can collect it. So, but you're correct. If the laser can't connect to the object and it's obscured by another thing, then it's not going, that point is not going to be registered. Yep. Um, thanks, Colin, for that added. Uh, Helen, you're asking, how would you address the desire of small practice architect to be very hands-on in the production of their own drawings and becoming familiar with their subject uh, project? as well as the occupants through the process of hand measuring, observing, and can you address cost benefit comparison for the same? Great question. Um, so basically, we offer a number of different solutions for that, if you want to call them that. Um, I offer to my clients, have us go out, do the measure, and then you can go out with those drawings in hand to familiarize yourself while you meet with your client. Um, that's one option. Uh, I have a couple of clients who at first started to meet with me at the same time or have meet with their client at the same time that I was there to measure. Uh, and then they were meeting and familiarizing themselves with the house while I was getting the measurements for them. Um, we provide uh, still photos as standard with our um, deliverables. So you get the photos so you can walk through the house while you're looking at our plans. Um, you can, uh, we've had clients and I don't know if Cameron is still on, but Cameron was on for a little bit. He's our, uh, uh, regional director for the Southern California office. I know he's had a client that actually went from getting the full set of as builts to getting the point cloud to going back to getting the as builts because they decided that they you know, went back and forth on what they thought they needed or wanted. So, um, you know, maybe Cameron could hop in on that one too. But, um, but yeah, there's we we'll work with you however you want to work to still do what you need to do. Um, I know that that the as built process is a big part of understanding the building, um, but also it it can take a lot of time. So we're happy to free up some of that time, and you can still meet with your client and familiarize yourself with the building. Yeah. And as Justin suggested, if you do later go to the site with plans in hand, then you get to spend that time getting to know the occupants. And maybe by that time, you'll have some particular questions that you saw in plan view that you can really focus on. And you don't have to spend all that time measuring every little thing. And you get to skip that. And just to address the cost benefit comparisons, um, I like to just ask, you know, think about it in terms of your hourly. Um, if if you're hourly to travel to the site, measure it, draft it or model it, and then get and then at that point get started on your design is more than what we're offering to do that same thing for, then that's something to consider. And our goal is to always be lower than that. <laughs> Um, and we usually are, so. Thank you, Colin, appreciate mm -hmm. that. Justin, do you wanna stop um, screen sharing for just a moment and go to gallery view and we can kind of see the faces in the group? And sure, happy to do that. Um, is it, a, it's a vertical measuring tape, I think, let's see. I think that was just a comment. Um, but Mike, if you had a further clarification on that that you wanted to say by all means please you know un unmute and and pipe in if you want uh do you do certified as built drawings uh if you're referring to boma uh yes and no um we don't do it really as much as we used to uh we often will actually refer it out um but if
if that's what you're referring to. We can measure Taboma standards and provide a CAD file to BOMA standards, but creating that packet that you might be used to if you're a commercial architect um, that has all the square footage breakdowns, um, that's kind of an entirely different profession. Um, so we, we usually look to others and we have tons of partners that, that we work with in that capacity. Thank you, Colin. Um, what typically would be the cost to do as built for an elementary school, say? Um, uh, Again, I think look at our ballpark pricing on our website. Um, an elementary school is a fairly reasonably large size project. Um, we'd probably want to know more. Uh, Colin, I don't know, you've, you've dealt a little more in schools with our services than I have, but I, I wouldn't even want to throw numbers out. Uh, sure, I just, like I've, me I've measured a couple schools recently. They're shut down and <laughs> they have the means they're looking to improve them. Uh, in the meantime so um, it's definitely tough to give you a typical cost for a school because we always look at the structure itself and the the fees are based on the sheer size the square footage the scope of work that you need is a big needle mover and then the complexity of the structure um, but i will say that there's economies of scale so the more ground we're covering the lower the cost will be at least per square foot in most cases and you know, if your school is a giant rectangle, if it's just one big open gymnasium, it's gonna cost much less um, than something more in intricate that's got you know cathedrals and things like that going on. So um, I would suggest getting a quote because quotes are always free and we're happy to give them out for whatever project you have. I would also say that our quotes typically go get turned around within one to two business days. So we're usually pretty quick. So if you need a ballpark number on a specific property, we're usually pretty quick to turn it around. It looks like Cameron gave a great answer uh, in the chat. from his perspective in the chat, if you wanna read that about that other question. Sure, I'll, re I'll read it. So to follow up on, on the uh, uh, going to the site and things, um, you can always provide point cloud data, site photos ahead of final plan delivery and almost instantaneously after field visit to assist the clients in familiarizing themselves with their project as early as possible. And that also comes as no additional cost to provide that uh, in addition to the, the rest of the deliverable. Um, that's a lot of questions. We have more time. Are there are there any other questions or did we miss any? Yeah, to the individual that asked to share the website and contact if info that's been pasted into the chat as well, um, if you're looking for that. Thank you, Colin. And I can also uh, re-screen share. Um, before we're done with some contact information in a little bit, but. Justin and um, Colin, maybe just to let everyone know also, we'll follow up with the deck so you all have a copy of it and provide some contact information in there as well after, it, it'll probably come to you uh, probably tomorrow. Sure, so there are a couple of additional questions that popped in here. One is, did you mention Matterport? Um, Yes, I, we both alluded to it. Um, I actually probably do more of them in this area than uh, our other areas all combined. There seems to be a, a greater desire on the East Coast here for it. Um, I will say a couple of things about Matterport. It's great for what it is. We do not rely on them for as-builts. Um, the accuracy just isn't quite there. Um, but they're a great virtual tour tool. I have a couple of clients who um, have them as standard with the rest of their deliverable on every project uh, so that they can uh, do exactly what we mentioned before, familiarize themselves with the house. Uh, and during COVID now, um, it allows contractors and others to get in the properties uh, as well um, without having to actually physically be there. I will also say though, that it is not a core service of ours. Um, we do add it as, as sort of a, an extra, but because we rely on the LiDAR technology and other things to, for accuracy, um, uh, that's not our primary tool. Um, 
do you cover New Jersey? Uh, yes, uh, we have. So I should say a little bit more about our company. We are based in Southern California, but we have regional offices in other places, uh, such as the DC area. And um, depending on where in New Jersey, we can either cover it directly from the regional office here in the, in the DC area, or um, we do have a national team, if you will, we call them special operations. They handle all of our large multi-site or any project that happens anywhere that we don't necessarily have a firm office presence. Um, they'll manage uh, projects anywhere. So basically we have 50 state coverage, but um, from the DC area here, um, I cover basically roughly three hours ish from the DC metro area. How do you handle covering the variances that happen when measuring a historic structure without level floors? <laughs> um, <laughs> There's a lot, there's a few different ways and we kind of covered it with the wall variances as well, but basically if it's over a certain pitch, we'll call you and say, do you want to show it with a three inch pitch from one side of the room to the other, or do you, uh, do you want to show it as, as level? Um, we have our kind of standard tolerances and, uh, on where we keep it level. And then beyond that, we, we always ask the client. So it's really really kind of up to you how you want to show it. Yeah, a section cut would be the thing that comes to mind for me having it in the most, the place with the most vari variance. So that way you can just see that visually and measure it using the distance tools and things like that. Yep. Thank you, Lauren, for that question. Um, any other questions or did I miss any? We've got about 10 minutes left. If anybody has any additional questions, comments, concerns. I just want to mention that the uh, you all did the Matterport of the Leaf House, which is the AIA Potomac Valley Chapter House. I, I don't know if Sue mentioned that at the outset, but um, that is something everybody can look at. Um, certainly people who have been to the Leaf House, which uh, was the 2007 entry by the University of Maryland in the solar decathlon. And they won second place in that. Subsequently, I think it's 2011, by the way, they uh, University of Maryland won first place, um, kept trying and, and eventually did win. But uh, it's a very interesting structure and um, it is fully portrayed in a Matterhorn, uh, Matterport, <laughs> Matterhorn that uh, was done by PPM uh, very generously to, uh, it's very beneficial for everybody who loves three-dimensional uh, representations and it does show what that uh, capability is. So have a yeah. look at the chapter. And you, can even, and you can even see on that one, if you go to that, uh, the Leaf House um, Matterport, you can actually see how you can use the measuring tool. And it, like I said, it is fine for what it is. It's not uber accurate, but um, it gives you a rough sense of, of the space and ability to measure. and. And like what we did with Leaf House, you can actually do it as part of a tour. Um, we also did it with uh, AIA Northern Virginia with the Heights building. Uh, and they're, they're utilizing some other functions and features of it too as part, part of a post-project um, tour, if you will. So it does have some great, great things. And, and as Helen said, you can see the, some of the capabilities there. Well, it sounds like everybody is questioned, asked everything they want. Last chance, everybody. If you have anything that you want to ask, don't be afraid. This is a good chance. And uh, if there are questions that you're afraid to ask in the group but would like to ask anyway, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, reach out to me and send me an uh, email or call me or whatever. I'm happy to, to answer questions at another time as well. Right. Well, with that, um, thank you all for a very interesting uh, program. I think it's gonna be um, giving a lot of people a lot to think about and uh, you, I, I suspect you'll get more questions. Um, but um, yes, be sure to see the chat box if you wanna save the information and um, about the, the contact information that is. And 
I want to thank our sponsors again, including PPM, for making this program possible, uh, and as well as Barron's and T.W. Perry. And um, look forward to seeing you all in the next program. And I would just like to add as well, thank you so much for allowing us to give this uh, class and presentation, and we appreciate everybody's interest and uh, desire to get on and, and listen to us talk about what we're so passionate about. So thank you. Thank you for that.